Since the holy sacrifice of the Mass is the center of our faith, it's the most important action in the Catholic religion and the chief form of worship to God instituted by Christ at the Last Supper, I'd like to talk about the Mass during the next few weeks and then how it's been attacked. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. My dear and the beloved in Christ, St. Francis de Sales described the Mass as the most holy, sacred, and royal sacrifice the center of the Christian religion, the heart of devotion, the soul of piety, an ineffable mystery which embraces the untold depths of divine charity in which God, giving himself to us, bestows upon us freely all his favors and graces. According to Father Frederick Faber, the traditional mass of the Roman rite is the most beautiful thing this side of heaven. The devils have an indescribable hatred for the holy sacrifice of the Mass because it's the unbloody renewal of the sacrifice of the cross which inflicted the greatest harm on Satan in his effort to, to ruin souls. The evil spirits are fully aware of the great spiritual blessings which are imparted to the church, the faithful, and the world during Mass. Therefore, it's no wonder that Satan inspired the modernists and ecumenists to target the Mass at Vatican II. Spurned on by the devil, the modernists aimed to destroy the very heart of the Church and to do away with the holy sacrifice of the Mass once and for all. In 1907, Pope St. Pius X relentlessly attacked the modernist heretics who were dismembering the Church from within. He clearly exposed and systematically refuted the doctrinal errors of the modernist and his modernist heretics in his encyclical Pescendi. Undoubtedly, were anyone to attempt to the task of collecting together all the errors that have been broached against the faith and to consecrate, concentrate into one the sap and substance of them all, he could not succeed in doing better than the modernists have done. My dearly beloved in Christ, he said, they lay the axe to the, not to the branches and shoots, but to the very root, that is to the faith and its deepest fires, including the holy sacrifice of the mass. And having struck at this root of immortality, they proceed to disseminate poison through the whole tree, so that there's no part of Catholic truth from which they hold their hand, none that they do not strive to corrupt. Pope Gregory the Sixteenth described the traits of the modernist in singulari nos. Blind they are, they pervert the eternal concepts of truth. They are seen to be under the sway of a blind and unchecked passion for novelty. Despising holy and apostolic traditions, they embraced other and vain, futile, uncertain doctrines condemned by the Church. The modernists are arguably the most insidious and destructive enemies in the history of the Catholic Church. The deadly cancer of modernism was the permeating philosophy in Vatican II. With the pretense of elevating the Catholic Church by means of a radical renovation, the modernists have attempted to destroy the holy sacrifice of the Mass. As early as 1937, modernists attempt to introduce liturgical changes. The Bishop of Linz, Austria, in the province of Vienna, found it necessary to rebuke extreme liturgists in his diocese who wished to turn the altar around and celebrate the Mass facing the congregation. To remove the tabernacle from the altar and to reserve the Blessed Sacrament in a safe in the wall, to have the faithful receive communion standing, and to forbid the recitation of the rosary during Mass. My dearly beloved in Christ, many of these changes were condemned ten years later by Pope Pius XII. Thus, to cite some instances, one would be straying from the straight path where he too wished the altar restored to its primitive table form, were he to forbid the use of sacred images and statues in the church. Were he to order the crucifix so designed that the divine redeemer's body shows no trace of his cruel sufferings. Beyond a doubt, the holy sacrifice of the mass 
has been essentially changed since the Second Vatican Council. How did this occur? The Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy of Vatican II was the medium by which radical changes were introduced into the liturgy. The modernists who drew up these, this document intentionally used equivocation to achieve their ends. These inexact formulations were deliberately introduced so that the interpreters could gloss over or reinforce whichever ideas they liked. Sheila Beeks described their cunning plan. We will express it in a diplomatic way, but after the council, we'll draw out the implicit conclusions. Following the council, the liberals justified their sacrilegious liturgical experimentation by citing Vatican II's constitution on the liturgy, since it was purposely vague and ambiguous. Under the direction of John the Twenty-Third, Paul the Sixth, and John Paul II, the Vatican specifically enacted numerous liturgical changes that were implemented by means of nearly 120 post-conciliar documents on the liturgy. The number of post-conciliar documents on the liturgy is very great, greater than in any other post-conciliar era. Area. The Constitution of the Liturgy enabled modernists to substantially change the Mass and sacraments. On the surface, the Constitution sounded like little more than an idea for dropping the traditional Latin in certain parts of the Mass and permitting those parts to be said in the language of the people. Nevertheless, some of the conservative fathers, later referred to as traditionalists, recognized its true nature and voiced their opinion. Fierce doctrinal battles were waged on the council floor. On October 23, 1962, Cardinal James McIntyre of Los Angeles expressed his convictions. The schema in the liturgy proposes confusion and complication. If it is adopted, it would be immediate scandal for our people. The continuity of the Mass must be kept. The tradition of the sacred ceremonies must be preserved. Changes are not needed. On November 5th, 1962, His Eminence one again addressed the conciliar gathering. In recent times, even in materialistic North America, the growth of the church was magnificent with the liturgy being kept in Latin. The attempt of the Protestants have failed and Protestants use the vernacular. We ask again why the change, especially since changes in this matter involve many difficulties and great dangers. If the sacred liturgy were in the vernacular, the immutability of doctrine would be endangered. Grave changes in the liturgy introduce grave changes in dogma. My dearly beloved in Christ, nevertheless, the push for liturgical changes continued, including the introduction of a vernacular mass spearheaded by the European allegiance, a liberal modernist group who held an iron grip on the council by controlling its committees, a grip that was established and enabled by both John the Twenty-Third and Paul the VI. In turn, any doctrinal battles on the council floor between traditionalists and liberals ended with the muzzling or ridiculing of any council father who was brave enough to speak against radical doctrine, null, or liturgical changes. This was clearly evidence in the case of Cardinal Alfredo Taviani, the most powerful cardinal in the Roman Curia. On October 30th, 1962, Cardinal Ottaviani, a distinguished prelate and prefect of the Holy Office, addressed the council in St. Peter's Basilica, saying, Are we seeking to stir up wonder or perhaps scandal among the Christian people by introducing changes in so venerable a rite that has been approved for so many centuries and is so familiar? The rite of Holy Mass should not be treated as if it were a piece of cloth to be refashioned according to the whim of each generation. Cardinal Ottaviani demanded to know whether the fathers were planning a revolution. The liturgy was sacred ground, he said. Changes in the Mass would scandalize and alienate the faithful. Ottaviani, 
who was hard of hearing, kept speaking after his allotted 10-minute time frame had expired. The moderator, Colonel Bernard Alfrink, ordered the technician to turn off his microphone. After, after confirming the fact by tapping the instrument, Colonel Ottaviani stumbled back to his seat in humiliation. The most powerful cardinal in the Roman Curia had been silenced, and the council fathers clapped with glee. After nearly a month of intense debate, the council approved certain limited liturgical reforms, among them the right of the bishops to decide whether parts of the Mass could be said in the language of their own countries. This was in reality the essence of the modus operandi of the council. Shrewdly, the modernists knew that their changes had to be made at first slowly and subtly. Later, once their plan was in full operation, they could forge ahead. Semi seemingly limited reforms actually open the floodgates to the terrible abuses we see in the new litur liturgies today. Beginning in 19, I'm sorry, beginning in 1815, hundreds of thousands of signatures of the hierarchy and the laity had been sent to the Vatican, requesting permission to insert the name of St. Joseph into the canon of the Mass. One of the reasons assigned for making the request was that so many persons had a particular devotion to the saint. The Sacred Congregation of Rites steadfastly refused to grant the petition. The church remained firm in her refusal, which was binding in Rome and everywhere else. So careful is the church to prevent innovations from entering into this part of the Mass that she forbids anyone to meddle with it under pain of incurring her most severe censures. The campaign to promote this change became quite intense even prior to Vatican II. Monsignor Joseph Phelan of St. Joseph's Church in Capitola, California, launched a drive which netted 150,000 signatures. It didn't take the modernists long to use this seemingly innocent request to the benefit of their devious purpose. Long before the council, booklets containing a petition were published and circulated to the council fathers. The modernists, under the guise of promoting devotion to St. Joseph, soon became actively involved in this movement to include St. Joseph and the communicantes of the Mass. The insertion of St. Joseph would serve as a wedge to break open the canon and authorize changed to the very words of consecration, their main target. On November 13, 1962, the Cardinal Secretary of State announced that John XXIII had decided to insert the name of St. Joseph in the canon of the Mass, immediately after the name of the Most Holy Virgin. John XXIII had taken this independent action while the Second Vatican Council was in session. This bold move marked a major victory for the liturgical modernist, a revolution which would in the end culminate with the Novus Ordo Mise, the new order of the Mass. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Last week we talked about the changes to the Mass. I'd just like to give just a little introduction before we continue. Francis, you know, his, name, his last name is Bergoglio, uh, it's been, you know, hailed by Freemasons. Um, there's a book that came out, Masoni, and this is by Giole Magaldi, and uh, he writes, It's therefore necessary to remark how the Masons from all over the world today look to the new course of Pope Papa Bergoglio with great hope. And uh, we talked about John the 23rd, he put St. Joseph's name into the canon of the Mass, he began Vatican II. Um, the changes in society, the changes in the church, you know, are not accidental. You know, Satan uh, is behind these, uh, dis the destruction of the Catholic Church, the changing of the Mass, and he has a plan, and there's people working for him, the Freemasons, Communists, Modernists, there's a whole list of people. And then with John the 23rd, um, he was received into the 
Freemasons in 1940. And then this book, you know, goes into the, um, the different lodges he was in, um, in uh, East Nunball and in Paris. One of the chapters begins like this, the introduction, the Freemason and Rosicrucian Angela Roncalli, a.k.a. Pope John the Twenty-Third, the Second Vatican Council and the dream of the modern harmony between religious exotericism, in other words, the Catholic Church, and Masonic esotericism, functioning as a renewed season of equality, brotherhood, and freedom. Just like during the French Revolution, egalité, fraternité, uh, egalité, liberté, egalité, fraternité. It's the same cry as the French Revolution. And then it talks about um, the, and then on page 151 says, the Cardinal Conclave of 1958 thus brought on October 20th the election of, and on November 4th, the incarnation of the Freemason and Rosicrucian Angelo Giuseppe Roncalli as the 20, 261st Bishop of Rome and Pope of the Catholic Church. Brother Roncalli received his first Masonic initiation in Istanbul in 1940. making the arrival in the Turkish metropolis coincide with the, his entrance into Freemasonry. And then um, a number of well-known Freemasons, uh, Gieto was the Freemason in charge of all of Italy, and then he said he was, um, uh, became inducted into the Freemasons. And it's interesting, it's on the cover, the inside cover, it's got a list of all these uh, famous world figures who are Masons, and then they get a nice color picture of John the 23rd. And then it said, um, so that was 1958. A little later in the 20th century, it says, also on the wave of a long collaboration between the Vatican, not Pope Pius XII in the, the true church, but the infiltrators, the Masons, the modernists, a little later in the 20th century, also in the wave of a long collaboration between the Vatican and the Masonic Circuit and the construction of a united Europe, it matured into a singular project of ul ulterior collaboration between certain sections of the Masons and then the Catholic agenda. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. My dear and beloved in Christ, once the clergy had been desensitized to change, Paul VI proceeded to replace the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass with the New Mass, or Novus Ordo Mise. On January 3, 1964, Paul VI commissioned Monsignor Anna Balbanini, a priest who was also a free Mason. And then later it became known, and then even though he was working in the Vatican, he had all these high positions, he was sent to Iraq. On January 3, 1964, Paul VI commissioned Monsignor Arnold Bambanini, a priest who was a Mason, to work with a group of advisors to create a new Mass that would be acceptable to Protestants and non-Catholics. Paul VI chose six Protestant ministers to assist Benini in composing this new Mass. The special commission became known as the Concilium for the Implementation of the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy. The head of the Concilium was the liberal Cardinal Lair Caro, whom Cardinal Tanioni Bacci described as Luther resurrected. The very fact that six non Catholic ministers were allowed to create a Mass for the Catholic Church is so absurd, it's difficult to believe that this was actually done. It'd be just as ridiculous to attend, entertain the idea for even a moment that the Protestant churches, or any other religion for that matter, would allow a group of six traditional Catholic priests, liturgists, to write a new worship service for their religion. Nevertheless, it did occur. This alone reveals the heretical nature of Vatican II. At first, their true intentions were couched under the pretense that they were merely translating the Latin liturgy into the vernacular. However, if liturgical reform meant that the Tridentine Mass was merely to be translated into the vernacular, Catholic linguists, not Protestant ministers, should have been chosen to oversee the project. 
Further, Latin Mass had already been translated into most of the vernacular languages in prayer books or missals. Cardinal McIntyre of Los Angeles noted that prior to Vatican II, very many of the faithful read the whole Mass assiduously and privately with the help of missals. These missals are written, are written either in the vernacular or with Latin on the same page. Sadly, the Mass was not accurately translated into the vernacular, not even paraphrased, for that was not the intention. It was completely rewritten. Paul VI was determined to destroy the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass to replace it with a new ecumenical service. This is clearly evident in the original definition of the Novus Ordo. It starts like this. Uh, the Lord's Supper... Okay, the Lord's Supper is Luther's definition of the Mass. The Lord's Supper or Mass is a sacred assembly or congregation of the people of God gathering together with a priest presiding to celebrate the memorial of the Lord. This definition was so openly heretical that it had to be modified. So later versions, it, they changed a few words. Against the objection of the majority of the first General Assembly of the 1967 Synod of Bishops, Paul VI continued its development anyway. In his work entitled The Reform of the Roman Liturgy, Monsignor Klaus Gamber stated, In spite of the careful advance work that had already been done and the skilled manipulation and management of the sessions themselves, the first General Assembly of the 1967 Synod of Bishops did not approve, with the required two-thirds majority vote, the so-called Misa Normativa, the forerunner of the new Novus Ordo Mass. Even so, the development of the new Ordo Misa continued anyway. In a study of the Novus Ordo Misa, Cardinal Alfredo Taviani, former prefect of the Holy Office, has, has written, to abandon a liturgical, liturgical tradition which for four centuries stood as a sign and pledge of unity and worship, and to replace it with another liturgy, which, due to the countless liberties it implicitly authorizes, cannot but be a sign of division, a liturgy which teems with insinuations or manifest errors against the integrity of the Catholic faith is, we feel, bound in conscience to proclaim an incalculable error. He further declared that the new Mass represents both as a whole and in its details a striking departure from the Catholic theology of the Mass as it was formulated in Session 22 of the Council of Trent. In fact, a true Pope could not promulgate a new Mass, which quote, teams with manifest errors against the integrity of the Catholic faith and, quote, represents a striking departure from the Catholic theology of the Mass. The modernists, nevertheless, continued with their agenda and not, did not take them long to attack the very heart and essence of the Mass itself, the words of consecration. In the Mass, transubstantiation, in other words, a change of the whole substance of the bread and wine into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ does not take place if the matter, in other words, the bread and wine, the form, the words, or the intention of the priest are essentially changed. The bread and wine remain merely bread and wine. This was clearly put forth by St. Thomas Aquinas when he wrote, Now it's clear, if any substantial part of the sacramental form be suppressed, that the essential sense of the words is destroyed and consequently the sacrament is invalid. The great doctor of the church, St. Alphonsus Liguori, reaffirmed this when he said, if anyone abbreviates or changes something in the form of the consecration and the words do not signify the same thing, he does not confect the sacrament. The De Defectibus Decree, which is found in every altar missal, prior to the Vatican II, is almost identical to the wording of this passage. St. Alphonsus stated in his moral theology that the words used for the consecration of the hope, Ocestanum corpus meum, for this is my body, are divinely instituted by Christ and are the universal practice of the church. 
Martin Luther and the new reformers of Vatican II have added the words, which will be given for you. It may seem to be an insignificant change, but there's a specific reason for the alteration. The traditional words of consecration denote an event that's taking place here and now. The new terminology denotes a future event and leaves room for various interpretations of the fact. This also explains why the blessing of the offerings prior to the consecration was dropped by the Episcopalians, Lutherans, and the so-called reformers of Vatican II. The words of the original blessing of the host and wine ask God to make them approved, effective, right, and holy, pleasing in every way, that it may become for our good the body and blood of thy dearly beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. These words were far too explicit for the modernists and ecumenists who found it necessary to discard them. My dearly beloved in Christ, the essential words for a valid consecration of the wine are Ekes denum calix sanguinis mei novi et eterni testamenti mysterium fidei qui provobis et promultis et fundetur in remission in peccatorum. For this is the chalice of my blood of the new and eternal testament, the mystery of faith, which shall be shed for you and for many unto the remission of sins. The De Defectibus states clearly, if anyone should take away from or change anything of the form of the consecration of the body and of the blood, and in the very change of the words, the words should not mean the same thing, he would not confect the sacrament. St. Thomas Aquinas explains why our Lord used the words for you and for many at the Last Supper. The blood of Christ's passion has its efficacy not merely among the elect among the Jews to whom the blood of the Old Testament was exhibited, but also for the Gentiles, not only for the priests who confect the sacrament or others who receive or partake, but likewise for those for whom it is offered. And therefore he says expressly, for you, the Jews, and for many, namely the Gentiles, or for those who partake, and for many for whom it is offered. The Catechism of the Council of Trent further explains this important point. With reason, therefore, were the words for all not used, as in this place the fruits of the passion alone are spoken of. In other words, who would be saved? Many would be saved. And to the elect only did his passion bring the fruit of salvation. Our worship reflects our beliefs. This truth is expressed by the idiom Lex Arandi, Lex Credendi. And I saw this in an article by the Vatican II Church. They uh, were explaining why they have to outlaw the Latin Mass. And they use the same words. The law of praying is a law of believing. Therefore, the post conciliar Church had to destroy the holy sacrifice of the Mass because it contradiction, contradicted the teachings of ecumenism and modernism. When Paul VI replaced Christ's words for you and for many, with the words, for all men. Because that originally it was for all men, and then they said that was sexist, it's for all. You know, um, He changed the essential words of the consecration of the Mass. Our Lord Jesus Christ died for the salvation of all, but his passion and death were efficacious only for the many who are saved. In his book, The Holy Eucharist, St. Alphonsus says, the words, pro vobis et pro multis, for you and for many, are used to distinguish the virtue of the blood of Christ from its fruits. For the blood of Christ is of sufficient value to save all men, but its fruits are applicable only to a certain number and not to all, and this is their own fault. Concerning the necessity of the complete form for validity of the sacrament, St. Thomas Aquinas has written, some have maintained that the words, this is a chalice of my blood, alone belong to the substance of the form, but not the words which follow. Now this seems incorrect, because the words which follow them are determinations of the predicate, that is, of Christ's blood. Consequently, they belong to the integrity of the expression. Knowing full well that the changes made in the words of consecration were in complete contradiction of the words of Christ, 
the teachings of the church, Paul VI nevertheless promulgated the new mass in his apostolic constitution, Missali Romanum, and commanded it to be universally celebrated on March 22, 1970. Paul VI tried to soften the blow by saying that Catholics should prepare themselves to be disturbed by these changes, adding that pious people will be those most greatly disturbed. What a giveaway. One would ask at this point, if everything including the council were good, true, and valid, valid then why would the pious be disturbed? The Protestant liturgies created by the so-called reformers of the 16th century were invalid due to defect of form, the words, in other words, since they changed the wording. Isn't it paradoxical that the new liturgies drafted after Vatican II, the liturgies that were used in the new mass for a very long time, employed the same changes made by the Protestants? Is it maybe because six Protestant ministers were active in its creation? Shortly after the conclusion of the Second Vatican Council, a new mass, the Novus Ordo Missae, was formulated in which substantial changes were made to the words of consecration and also the offertory prayers, which are essential. These essential changes have rendered the new mass invalid as testified by the doctors of the church, St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Alphonsus Liguori, the De Defectibus Decree of Pope St. Pius V and the Catechism of the Council of Trenton. Therefore, because of the matter, form, and or intention of the Mass were essentially changed, transubstantiation does not take place. And then now with the, when they re brought the words back for you and for many, the fact that the priests who were ordained in the new rite since 1968 and then the bishops are invalid, even if they have the right words. The offertory is destroyed, the intention is destroyed, and um, so this type of mass is invalid, sacrilegious, and an affront to Almighty God. The re so-called reformers of Vatican II have sealed their own fate. For in his papal bull, quo primum, Pope St. Pius V threatened anyone who would dare to essentially change the mass with the wrath of Almighty God and the Blessed Apostles Peter and Paul, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.